But now it's Anna who will introduce our PhD candidate today, Jan Runge. Thank you, Anna. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all today to this um, virtual defense of Jan Niklas Runge. Um, it's really great to see you all. Um, we have a special guest, Professor Nina Vadel from the University of Exeter. We have Professor Andres Bendeski from University of Columbia, who's a collaborator on part of the work. Um, we have many collaborators from the University of Zurich and um, family and friends of Jan. So welcome, all of you. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Jan for a bit more than four years now. Um, it's been uh, wonderful to have him in the group. Um, before he came um, to Zurich, he was in, in Göttingen where he did his master's work. And I'm very pleased to say that I rescued him from his job as content manager at my ex place, <laughs> uh, which is what he was doing before he, he came to join us in Zurich. Um, so Jan will tell us about what he's done um, during his PhD in about the next 45 minutes or so. Um, then we will have a period of questions from the audience. And it's, it, um, it's probably easiest given the number of us if people could indicate on the chat if they would like to give to ask a question at the end because then I can look at the chat and I can I can call out that person and and then we can go from there um, at the end of the uh, open question time we will ask all of you um, to leave who are not participating in the second part of the exam and I believe you'll be thrown out of the meeting, um, but we'll ask you to join again because once Jan has, has successfully completed his, um, the second part of his exam, we'd like you all to come together um, to celebrate um, with Jan. We'll have a, a virtual apero at the end. And I have the emails of some of you so that I can let you know what time at the moment when Jan is finished so you can join in again. Um, for others, I'm afraid you might just have to check in um, from time to time to see if it's been opened again. So sorry for that inconvenience for those of you, but I will notify um, as many people as I can. Um, and with that, I would like to open the floor to Jan. Okay, great, thank you. Um, let me just share my screen. I hope you can all see now. Just, um, yeah, okay, should be fine. Um, yeah, thank you very much. And thank you very much for, for coming, uh, even though this is not the ideal format of a defense that perhaps I was um, thinking about when I you know, first thought about defending my PhD. Um, it's still nice that this is um, at least technologically feasible to do it like this. So yeah, I will talk about what I've done in the last four years, or at least perhaps the most important uh, things I've done in the last four years. Um, and if you are looking for a place to put the camera, um, if you, you so want, I've left the top corner, um, top right corner free for you to, to use that. Okay. Um, so last year, perhaps some of you have seen this wonderful uh, photograph um, that was taken by Sam Rowley of two mice fighting in the London underground. And I think what's so great about this picture is it really captures the the essence of what evolution is all about. It's all about conflict, conflict between species, between populations, between individuals. And this conflict is fought by organisms, complex organisms, and DNA is cooperating to create these complex organisms. And that's how we usually think about um, DNA and organisms, this wonderfully complex um, cooperative effort um, by genes and DNA in general. But there's Conflict actually it's at the heart of this uh, cooperative effort itself. You could see this most clearly illustrated when we look at diploid organisms such as humans or in this case, of course, mice that carry, of course, two uh, sets of chromosomes and only half of these are transmitted every time they reproduce. You can see as indicated here, the yellow allele is being transmitted to the next generation. And that's all great. We never really think too much about it, perhaps. 
Um, but there's something quite obvious uh, missing here from that picture, and that is this purple allele in this case is not being transmitted to the next generation. And now, of course, there's conflict over being transmitted on the DNA level to the next generation. You can imagine quite easily that if this purple allele is perhaps very rare, then this uh, chance of not being transmitted alone might perhaps lead to extinction. So there's just this randomness of becoming extinct um, involved at the heart of this cooperative effort um, uh, that DNA undergoes to create organisms. Now this conflict is in large part solved by having fair transmission rate, uh, rates. I was just saying there's a 50% chance for this allele to be passed on. Um, and of course, this can be illustrated if there's more than one offspring, then roughly you will see a picture like this emerging where sometimes the yellow allele is transmitted, sometimes the purple allele is transmitted. But of course, that over evolutionary time, that's a fair way of solving that um, problem. But on the DNA level, we still have this problem that transmission could be um, against the allele that's in focus. So some DNA has evolved to become what's known as selfish DNA, and selfish DNA will always be indicated in this presentation in orange. Now, selfish DNA just very generally increases its own transmission. So it goes beyond this 50% chance of transmission and um, is perhaps found in virtually all offspring of um, a carrier, in this case a mouse, that carries the uh, selfish DNA. Now, of course, what that means for the purple DNA is quite catastrophic. The purple DNA might lose um, almost all chance of being transmitted in competition with such selfish DNA. But for the selfish DNA, it's great. It should really increase in frequency quite, quite dramatically. Now, one way that selfish DNA works is what's called meiotic drivers. Meiotic drivers are a kind of selfish DNA, and they are very much the focus of, um, to, of my um, presentation. So you can see here illustrated, uh, a capital D um, represents a meiotic driver. So a chromosome that carries a meiotic driver um, and the small d represents the homologous chromosome that does not carry the driver. And they are of course here at the individual level, um, an individual might carry a driving and a non-driving uh, allele. And then you can see uh, during meiosis when in this case sperm are being produced, some sperm, of course, will carry the driving allele because, of course, only half the genome is within any one sperm. Um, and then the non-driving allele will be carried by others. But what the driving allele does, it interferes with the viability of the sperm that don't carry the driving allele. So, of course, you can imagine that quite quickly the um, transmission rate of a driving allele will be increased dramatically if it, in, if it makes you know, the sperm that don't carry it in, in mo immobile or inviable or somehow else in, interferes with the fitness of them. Now, this of course, as I just mentioned before, places dramatic uh, pressure evolutionarily on the non-driving allele to do anything about this so that this doesn't happen. Because of course, if this happens, the non-driving allele will eventually become extinct if there's nothing else happening um, to prevent that. Now, so we, will, so we expect to see some mutations uh, perhaps taking place um, in those non-driving alleles that survive this conflict that might rescue the viability of the sperm and then uh, bring it back to an equal um, footing. So this is called suppression of this meiotic drive mechanism. So as a consequence of that, we expect meiotic drivers to basically meet one of two fates. Either they become extinct, perhaps because suppression evolves, um, and the, the driving mechanism doesn't function anymore. And then there's usually some costs associated with meiotic drive that then mean that the suppressor is more uh, viable, is, is, more, is, fit, is fitter than the meiotic driver. Or if there's no suppression evolving and there's nothing standing in the way of the fitness of the driver, then we expect them to become fixated so that every individual uh, would carry the driver in a population or perhaps in the entire species. If that were the case, however, if that was the whole story, then there wouldn't be much to talk about today. And so instead, we are focusing on what's known as the T-haplotype, which is a meiotic driver in house mice. 
that is neither fixated nor extinct. So it's somewhere in between. And that makes it very interesting because immediately the, uh, what I just talked to you about, that you expect either fixation or extinction, isn't the case in the t haplotype. And so it's a very interesting um, subject to study. Now, what is the t haplotype um, precisely on a more um, genetic level? The t haplotype is, as also the title of this presentation indicates, uh, a super gene, which means that it's a collection of hundreds of genes. And that is 40 MB in size, or in other words, it's about one third of a chromosome uh, in size. So it's quite a lot of genetic information um, that makes up this uh, t haplotype. It's about two million years old as well, which is important um, because you know, if, it's, if it's neither fixated nor extinct, but it's also already two million years old, then quite clearly it's rather stable in not, being, in not meeting either of these fates, um, which makes it even more interesting because now we have to figure out you know, what the hell is going on with um, this system. Now, it's linked by inversions, which is important and generally a case in supergenes. It means that some of the DNA, at least on four locations within this t haplotype, is um, inverted in this DNA sequence, which means that there's no more recombination with the homologous uh, chromosome, meaning that the t haplotype, this 40 MB large supergene, is virtually always transmitted as this supergene without any changes by recombining with the homologous chromosome. So selection can act on these 40 MB um, rather than just some parts of it. Now, what does it mean that the T is neither extinct nor fixated um, in practice? Here you can see a histogram of the T frequency in natural populations that have been sampled in another study. And you can see quite quickly that um, the majority, more than 50% of populations um, that were sampled here did not carry, or there were no T carrying mice detected in this population. So it's rather rare in that sense. And if it, T was detected in these populations, it was detected at very low frequency. So again, um, it's not fixated at all and it's not extinct, but it's also not extremely common either in the sense of frequency. This was known as the T paradox. So the paradox of course being, here we have a meiotic driver that increases its own transmission to the next generation, but we only find it at very low frequencies. That used to be the original paradox um, of the T haplotype. Now this paradox was solved, and let me quickly run you through um, the traits of the T haplotype that uh, um, contribute to this low, but neither uh, extinct nor very high frequency. So just to reiterate, of course, the main trait of the T haplotype is that it's a male meiotic driver. So it drives only in males. It can be transmitted by females, but at normal frequencies. But in males, if a male that's heterozygous for the T haplotype, so carries it on one chromosome, but not the other, um, mates with a wild type female that does not carry the T haplotype, and then the majority of the offspring will also carry the T haplotype. So that's the drive, right? Instead of 50%, we have like something like 90% of the offspring will carry the T haplotype. The first important fitness uh, drawback for the T haplotype takes place in matings between two heterozygous mice. Of course, in those matings, we expect that some of the mice, uh, some of the offspring will be homozygous, so we'll carry the T haplotype on both chromosomes. Um, but the big problem here for the T haplotype is that those offspring are not viable. They will never be born. Um, and that's because of recessive deleterious mutations that accumulate within the T haplotype. And if there's no more sort of normal uh, chromosome, normal variant to compensate um, for these mutations, then the mice would simply not be viable. So of course, this immediately limits the frequency of the T haplotype to at most 50% in any given population. But frequencies in the wild are still way below that. And so there's another important um, fitness drawback that has been discovered um, actually by one of my predecessors in the uh, T haplotype. And that comes into play if more than one male mates with the same female in one estrus cycle, which means that the sperm of these two males are competing over fertilization of uh, the eggs of this female. And what happens in such a case is that almost none of the offspring will carry the T haplotype. So this sire here, 
um, or this male rather, is siring almost none of the offspring. And that is because, well, the sperm of the tea, the tea carrying sperm are very competitive within the male that carries the tea haplotype. So they are basically destroying the sperm that don't carry the tea haplotype. But when they're competing with sperm of another male that never had anything to do with the tea haplotype, then um, they are very much not competitive. Um, and that's probably because they have been uh, harmed by the meiotic drive mechanism itself without going into too much detail here. So this is where my work starts and comes into play. I'm sort of asking the reverse T paradox, which is no longer about why the T hasn't fixated, why it's not everywhere, but now I'm asking, given the knowledge that has been gained over the recent um, decades, um, why did the T haplotype not go extinct? What is actually keeping it alive? Sure, the meiotic drive is a very powerful force, but given these strong disadvantages over time, over two million years, there should have been, um, it should be closer to extinction. Um, and I'm proposing that there is a new trait, a, a, new, a different trait that hasn't been described before that could solve this question. And this trait is um, dispersal. Dispersal means that it's basically a fancy word for, uh, for the laymen uh, that are listening for migration. So it means that an individual that's born in one population uh, leaves that population before breeding, moves to a different population and starts breeding there. Um, that is basically natal dispersal that um, I'm talking about today. And I'm proposing that the T haplotype should have been selected um, to increase the dispersal propensity, so the likelihood with which the mouse then migrates to a different population um, in its carriers. And I'll briefly show you in a verbal argument the main reason why that should be. So in house mice, what's important to know is density and sperm competition, so the frequency of you know, how, many, how often, uh, how likely females mate with multiple males in the same issue cycle, that is correlated. So in denser populations, we expect more uh, females to have mated multiple times. And so sperm competition, a big uh, detriment for the T haplotype will be more likely in high density populations. So if you imagine this mouse here in orange carrying the T haplotype in the dense population, if there's anything, any genetic basis that the T can be selected on um, to increase the likelihood of leaving such a dense population and moving to a, a lower density population um, where the T will likely do very well in terms of fitness. If there's anything genetic there, genetic basis to that, that the T can work on, a T variant that increases the likelihood of this happening should be selected. And so I'm proposing that one way this could, have, could happen is by simply increasing the general or density dependent um, likelihood to disperse in the T haplotype. And I'm briefly showing you the outline for what I'm talking about today, where I'm basically, you know, spoiler, uh, showing the evidence uh, that this is actually the case uh, in house mice. Um, first, I'm, we'll be talking about um, simulations, a more theoretical approach to this question, sort of to make sure that the verbal argument um, holds up in a more uh, formal setting. And then I will be talking about a long-term study results from that um, with regards to dispersal of, of tea carrying mice. Um, then I will uh, show some more um, uh, controlled experiments where we're also testing the dispersal, but also some other phenotypes. Uh, and finally, I will give a brief outlook onto the genetic basis of dispersal in house mice more generally that I've been working on more recently. Okay, so first of all, um, a formal approach to this question. What I'm using to look at that uh, is so-called agent-based simulations. So, those are, so sim these are simulations where you have basically, in this case, virtual mice, and you give them some traits, and then you see what happens. So here you can see some virtual mice running around. If you know the software, then you get extra points today. Um, and these virtual mice are very simple. They can be either male or female. They can carry the T or don't carry the T. They move, age, die, breed, not necessarily in this order. Um, and um, most importantly, of course, they disperse as juveniles. So they're migrating very far away um, from where they are born as juveniles based on a genetically determined propensity that is part of this simulation. And this propensity, of course, can mutate 
and is inherited. Um, and so let me quickly show you how these propensities can look like uh, in the simulations. So here you will see, and this will be very often the case today, um, population densities on the x-axis, which I allow, of course, for a density-dependent dispersal propensity. And the dispersal propensity, of course, is on the y-axis. And you see here, um, this is just how the simulations start. The T haplotype um, carrying mice uh, in orange, of course, and then in black or gray, the wild type mice. And both start at a 50% dispersal propensity independent of the density, right? So there's a 50% chance that they migrate when they're young, um, independent of you know, whether the population is dense where they are or not. And now over time in these simulations, and we look um, at you know, what evolves after many, many generations in these simulations, um, different functions can evolve. For example, they can evolve to disperse um, at a higher than 100% chance, which of course makes no sense, but uh, this means that it's very resistant to mutations dragging it back down to below 100%. So if it's above 400%, it would mean um, very strong selection to always disperse. It could be below zero, so you know, very strong selection to never disperse, or depending on density, you know, could decrease with density increase, and of course, at different points. Um, so all of these things are possible to evolve in these simulations. Okay, so let's look at what evolves. What evolves after many generations is this. You can see in orange, the T haplotype carrying mice will have evolved to almost never disperse um, at low densities, right? You can see here, um, this is about, uh, about half. Um, the mean, mean density is about here. Um, and at very low densities, they evolve to almost never disperse. And then increasingly with density, they evolve to disperse um, at higher rates. Though not at 100%, but you know, this is within the um, standard deviation, some will evolve that. In contrast, the wild-type mice evolve to basically never disperse, with some exceptions, perhaps at higher densities. A very strong difference in these simulations. Uh, and you can see here, this is a uh, percentage point. So right, there's 91 percentage points difference here at mean uh, density. So quite a strong difference in, in the mean functions that evolve, which of course, very much agrees with the verbal argument that I just laid out to you. Okay, but the great thing about simulations is that you can do whatever you want basically, which is also the problem with it. But um, you can see here, um, now I'm showing you different conditions uh, of simulations where I change a little bit how the world works in these simulations and see what that does to um, this difference between T haplotype and wild type that I just showed you. And this is a bit complicated here at first glance, but I'll walk you through it. On the y-axis now, you see the percentage of females receptive to mate multiple times. So basically, the fraction of females in the population that is sort of willing to mate multiple times, you know, uh, inherently willing. This is basically reshuffled every turn, and then just this percentage will be, uh, is then hard set in the, in the world. You can see at one, um, which is what we just looked at. I'm, I'm going to show it to you right here as well. Um, this, we, we just looked at this. Um, here, every female was uh, sort of willing, receptive to mate multiple times. But depending on the population density, of course, this is more or less likely to actually happen. There have to be enough males around. And, and the color coding now works as follows. In yellow, you see, you see areas where the dispersal phenotype is not different between T and wild type. And you can see that here, they're both below zero, right? So they both never don't disperse on average. Uh, and so this, this is yellow, there's no difference. And then with increasing difference in favor of T, this becomes more red. Okay, from looking at this, what we can see is that if we look at, for example, here, this area, um, where females are usually not willing to mate multiple times. So basically, you know, even if it's very dense and there's lots of males around, many females would choose sort of in the simulation, simulation not to mate multiple times. And then you can see that there's more generally a reddish um, color here. So T disperses more than wild type, more or less independent of the local density, uh, which makes perfect sense because the density no longer has a big impact. It has an impact, but a, not as big of an impact on whether females actually mate multiple times and sperm competition then occurs. Whereas in the top part, we see what we just saw. So if most females are you know, receptive to mate multiple times, then we see that there's no difference anymore in dispersal at low densities, meaning here that T and wild type both don't disperse 
but um, T disperses then more at higher densities. So what we learned from that is that this, um, this advantage in multiple mating in sperm competition is driving particularly this density dependent part of the difference in dispersal between T and bulk type. Now, we also want to know how the other trait plays a role, um, meaning the, um, the lethality of homozygous T carriers. So if we change that in the simulation right now, this is what we just looked at. And here we add another um, sort of dimension to this question, where here in this, um, we still vary polyandry as I just talked about, but now T homo homozygous mice are no longer as um, lethal um, as on the left hand side. I'm calling it semi-viable. There's still costs associated. You can ask me about that later, but just very briefly, there's still costs associated to being homozygous for T, but much lower costs. And you can see this takes away much of the difference between T and wild types, dispersal phenotypes. Most of the plot is yellow, so there's no more difference between T and wild type. Of course, this, this part of the plot also has low polyandry. So if we take both deleterious traits and remove them more or less from the, the world in which these T live, um, these virtual T mice live, then there's no more difference between T and wild type. But if polyandry is still quite likely, then we still see um, a density-dependent uh, dispersal propensity evolving um, uh, even when the costs of homozygosity are reduced. So both traits combined um, are actually what makes up this um, dispersal phenotype. So the density-dependent part is modulated by the disadvantage in multiple mating, which makes a lot of sense. And then the density-independent increase in dispersal is actually selected for by this homozygous lethality, which also makes sense. It's kind of an extreme um, uh, inbreeding depression where, you know, if, if two related mice that both carry the T have very high uh, chance of producing fewer viable offspring. So this too makes sense. But what's implied here is also very interesting for other um, researchers because the meiotic drive alone is not what uh, produces this phenotypic difference. Okay, but that's all fair and well, you know, virtual mice, it's, 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 a, it's a great um, experiment, but it doesn't really answer the question if that actually occurs in nature or not. And so now we will be looking at the long-term study project that, of course, is at the heart of the, the mouse group here uh, in Zurich. And in Zurich, it's, uh, and in our group, it's known as uh, the barn. The barn is an old agricultural building, a long-term study of house mice that was founded by Barbara Koenig, um, now in uh, 2002, so many, uh, many years ago. So there's a lot, a wealth of data really to look at. What's very interesting to us about this is that um, these the mice in this long-term study have been intensively monitored and they're able to leave this building anytime they want. Um, intensively monitored, particularly interesting for this project is that all the pups in this population that are born, they re reach a certain age, uh, 13 days old, they will be sampled genetically um, so we can identify uh, these pups and then they're assembled again as adults uh, where, where, where they also receive a transponder to identify them more quickly. And then as corpses, either uh, genetically or via the transponder, are identified again. So we know the lives of these mice. We know which pup becomes which adult and then later on becomes which corpse. Uh, and so we know, uh, we know a lot about them. And what I'm using is actually an indirect measure of dispersal because there has this, this study I guess, unfortunately for me, it wasn't set up to, um, to measure this person, but it would also have been extremely complicated as, also, as, as early researchers there also found out um, because the mice would just ingeniously find multitudes of ways out of the building. And so measuring them directly would have always been a big um, problem. Instead, I'm looking at mice that were found as juveniles, as pups, but then were never found again as adults and were never found again as corpses. So they just disappeared from the population. And I'm looking at those as my juvenile dispersers. Um, and um, I'm going to show you now what this looks like when we control for some uh, environmental variables and sex uh, and age. And um, these things uh, in a generalized linear model, we get the following result. We see again in orange and dotted here, uh, the T haplotype carrying juveniles, and then gray the uh, wild type juveniles. And we see the dispersive propensity, of course, again, the y axis and the density on the x, very much like the simulation uh, plot. And we see that basically almost like in the simulations, 
the T carry carriers have a higher propensity to uh, disperse, particularly at higher densities, but also already um, at the mean density here at almost 50% higher odds of um, dispersing or higher um, propensity to disperse. Um, and so this also very much agrees with the hypothesis and now also with the simulations. And that's why I always like to show it to you like this here, where the simulations predict basically this, and then the field data from the long-term study shows this. Not of, of course, not exactly the same. I mean, simulations will always miss things, um, but um, very much um, comparable uh, in their predictions and in the, the uh, stuff that we find in, in nature here in this long-term study. So just very briefly, this chapter, um, this long-term study agrees with the idea that um, tea-carrying mice should be more dispersive than um, wild-type mice. But if you were mean, you would say, this is just an n equals one sample size study. Um, and so what I've done is over, um, uh, over two years, I've conducted experiments um, to also look at this dispersal phenotype in a more controlled environment, but also some other phenotypes that I will show you in a moment. But first of all, dispersal. Now dispersal is of course a bit tricky experimentally. Um, the real thing sort of only happens in, in, in nature. Uh, and the vast distances and environments that need to be involved in like, creating actual dispersal opportunities are very complicated. So what we've done is um, a setting, a set up experimental um, replicate enclosures that are seven square meters. It's just a little um, view into one of these enclosures to separate it into multiple areas. And these enclosures start with eight or 16 mice and always 50% T, 50% wild type, 50% female. So very much trying to have it uh, as uh, controlled as possible in that regard. And these mice live in these enclosures. Now, what's of course important for us is you can see that there's a pipe uh, or tube leading uh, out of the enclosure to this box here. And this box is half filled with water and there's a barrier here. So the mice, if they want to really leave the enclosure, have to go here, swim through this water and then reach this cage here, which we know is the, uh, called the dispersal cage, where basically there's food and water and everything. Um, let me show you a different view of that as well. And what's important is mice don't really like to do that. They don't like to swim through these barriers. This is based on other studies that have worked with such a, such a barrier as representing dispersal. And so only some will actually leave the uh, enclosures this way. Now, doesn't mean that they're not terribly interested in the water. So you can see here a little video of a mouse um, looking at the water. This is at night, so just a <laughs> very tricky quality here. Um, but uh, very interested in the water, and there will also be a buildup of of, um, uh, of trash here basically in this tube um, that has to be then cleaned regularly because the mice will be very curious about it but will hardly ever uh, cross the water barrier. So in total, we had um, 24 mice that crossed the water barrier and they were distributed like this. Again, here treatment density now, not the like uh, messy density, but now very nice, either eight mice or 16 mice uh, density. And you can see once again in orange, these are the raw, raw counts of this process. T is overrepresented in, in both cases when it comes to the raw numbers, but much more so with high densities where most of T's dispersal actually takes place. Um, so this again agrees with the hypothesis. Now, we hypothesized, of course, that um, there was an interaction meaning that with density, meaning that density should influence the uh, likelihood of the dispersal of the two genotypes differently. But we also tested interactions with uh, sex, age, and weight, sort of as uh, exploratory, because we didn't find that uh, in the long-term study. Now, here, actually, we do, did find that. And now, careful, is a bit different than the other plots, because now, here, the rows are the densities, right? Uh, but on the x-axis, we now see weight. Weight actually matters uh, in, in this experiment, anyway, with regards to which genotypes uh, disperse you can see that the dispersal probability for T carriers in orange, of course, um, in, of, dif of different weights. So the mice, you know, of being of different weights, and this is basically only about males. We had like one female, I think, dispersing. So think about males in this context. Um, bigger males still in the T are more or less as likely to disperse, slightly less, but you can see that this is within the variation, um, about as likely to disperse independent of their weight. But wild types are much less likely to disperse 
uh, L if they have a higher weight uh, than the T uh, carrying mice. In, in contrast, unfortunately, <laughs> the density interaction, so this different uh, probability to this person, different densities, was not statistically significant. We can see in the raw numbers that, you know, this supports, generally speaking, this effect, but statistically speaking, probably we didn't have enough mice to really um, be sure of that, even though this is already two years of, of, of work. Um, so this is interesting, and you might think, you know, well, what about the long-term study where we didn't have that effect in the long-term study when it comes to weight differences, but um, we also couldn't really test it because we had to look at the pup weight, which is hardly predictive at all of the actual juvenile weight that we couldn't measure in the barn, but now we have it here, much, a much more timely measurement um, of weight uh, in this experiment. And let me briefly, because this is, we didn't hypothesize that, so let me just briefly give my interpretation of what this result means, um, uh, that weight plays a different role for this personal in T and wild type. Now, if we imagine a big, so this is supposed to be a big um, wild type mouse, if they stay in the population, there's a good chance that they might be successful. So weight, especially in males, weight predicts dominance in, in house mice, um, and um, ob often dominant males will evict or force non-subordinate males to leave. Um, and so higher weight males might be the ones that actually can stay and can be successful. But if a bigger tea-carrying mouse, um, perhaps more dominant because of the weight, but actually has a problem because if the population is dense, particularly, then all the dominance in the world doesn't really matter all that much. The females will mate multiple times and the fitness will be vastly reduced for this mouse. But perhaps, and this is not clear, of course, um, they could have a higher chance of dispersing successfully if they have a higher weight, meaning they could be in better condition to undergo the risky business of migration. In contrast, the, um, th these two mice here, they're supposed to represent smaller mice uh, of, of lighter weight. They would be less likely to be successful, more or less independent of density, uh, just generally less likely to be uh, successful or being an evicted by the dominance. Um, and so for them, this puzzle is a good option perhaps in uh, either way. So the big difference here is what does it mean to be a well-conditioned, um, big T, perhaps male um, mouse? That might, might be very different when it comes to dispersal um, than for wild types. Okay, I was saying it, we were looking also at other behaviors. Uh, what are those? Well, particularly exploration and locomotor activity have been linked in literature, though not super clearly, but sometimes to also predict um, dispersal or be higher in those that are more likely to, more, uh, likely to disperse. So we've also tested those to see, well, what exactly is it that T is manipulating? Because so far, you know, this person is sort of could be a composite of, of multiple underlying traits. So first, let's talk about exploration. You can see here the setup um, we've, that we've conducted this with. Um, there's three uh, cages and the mouse will be placed inside a cardboard roll that is then again wrapped in kitchen paper, both materials the mice are very familiar with. Um, sort of a uh, closed dark space, which perhaps we wouldn't like, but mice actually uh, find much more relaxing than to be just thrown into the experiment. And so they have a choice to actually leave this and start exploring or not explore at all or, uh, you know, take a bit more time doing that. And we're looking at a few variables. We're looking at how many of these compartments the mice have visited in a 25-minute window, how quickly these were, uh, of course, explored, and how often they move between them. And sort of all these variables together make up then uh, an exploration measurement using a PCA in the first dimension in those. Um, I'm just going to briefly show you here what this variation means. We have four mice here, a non-explorer. So a mouse never leaves this, uh, this couple role. The mouse is fine, but uh, just does, decides not to, uh, is, is my interpretation. A slow explorer, a fast explorer, even though it's a bit later, but it will explore better afterwards. And the fastest explorer that we have already visiting every, every part of the um, experimental setup. And this one takes a bit longer. And this one doesn't even explore all of them. So that's still tremendous variation. And let me show you how this looks in a plot. So here you can see your PCA, the first two dimensions. We only focus on PC1 that is highly correlated with all variables in the more explorative direction. So more compartments visited, quicker, quick, more quickly visited, visited, and more often moved between the compartments. Um, and in this plot, you can see a big blob here. That's more than half of the sample. It's all in this one uh, value, basically, because they didn't explore. So they never left 
a cardboard roll and just stayed in there. And of course, then all other variables are the same um, for these mice. But in the rest of them, there's still variation. Uh, but you know, just focusing on the x-axis here, where you can see you know, much more t in the more explorative direction uh, and a little less at this blob. And actually, in the end of the day, if we look at in a, in a model, this is a significant difference between t and wild type in exploration. But neither sex, age, or weight has any effect. So this effect of the t locus is actually bigger than some of the uh, typically looked at individual variables. So it's quite, um, quite a strong effect in that regard, even such a rather messy thing to analyze as exploration. Um, but again, this supports that t is a more dispersive uh, phenotype. Finally, we measured locomotor activity, and we did this, as is often done in mice, with uh, running wheels. So the mice have access to a running wheel three nights in a row, um, and they can do what, whatever they want with it. And then we look at how often the wheel was turned um, in this time frame, and we bring this down to a measure of um, uh, basically wheel, wheels turned, or the wheel, number of times the wheel was turned per hour of day. Uh, and here you can see a bit of mouse biology. So during the light hours of the day, there's almost no turning of the wheel indicated by the y-axis here. Um, but then at night, they will quickly, <laughs> quickly ramp up once it's dark and start um, being active. And of course, here you can see almost a perfect example of what it means if there's no difference between, <laughs> between things. Here, of course, there's no difference between the genotypes, which is not not surprising necessarily. Again, as I said, exploration and, and, and activity are sometimes in some species, but not perfectly um, uh, correlated with dispersal. So this is just adding some, the idea that perhaps um, either this is not the axis, that behavioral axis that T is, is manipulating, um, or dispersal and, and activity in general are not very uh, correlated in house mice. Females are more active, just as a side note, a bit of mouse biology again, than males, which is also what others have found. So we think we measured the right thing. Um, in terms of uh, wheel running, um, but we don't find a difference here. Okay, so these experiments also show T is more likely to disperse. Not so sure about the density part in these experiments, so a bit more tentative on that, but more likely to disperse in general. Um, also showing ex in increased exploration uh, tendencies, which again agrees with this um, uh, dispersive phenotype hypothesis. And the weight difference when it comes to this person is quite interesting. It's the first time we find this, so there needs to be some more studying on this, but it could suggest that the T has actually been quite well tuned to be a more optimal dispersal because what I didn't show here, but it's also interesting, T carrying mice in this, in this experiment anyway, were also about one gram heavier, which is quite a bit, bit in, in house mice of that age. So not only have, more likely to disperse at higher weights, but also of higher weights. So this could really uh, tell you a lot about how the T has been optimized, um, is optimizing its carrier, perhaps, for dispersal. And these three thematically very close chapters uh, I can now summarize in the following. The T is the first meiotic driver. So that's very important. The first meiotic driver that has been linked to a dispersive phenotype. Um, and um, uh, this is something that hasn't been observed before. This difference in dispersive phenotypes between T and wild type mice could explain the question I set out in the beginning, why the T survived as long as it did, if it can optimize a little bit better in what populations it's present. And finally, a bit more beyond the T haplotype, now that we have gathered so much evidence actually that this genomic region more generally is involved so strongly in this dispersal phenotype, we can also say that is quite rare in mammals. Um, we see such broad differences um, in, in dispersal related traits just based on a genomic region. Because usually it's more driven by many regions in a genome and um, more uh, driven also by the environment. Okay, uh, finally, I will talk a bit about what I've been working on more recently. This is gonna be a bit shorter than it needs to be to fully appreciate it, but um, I'm gonna uh, give you some of the details nonetheless. So I've been trying to uh, figure out this link between the haplotype and dispersal, but what about the remaining genetic variation is, you know, a lot of other chromosomes, um, 18 other chromosomes in house mice, um, when you only count the autosomes, that also will contribute to dispersal in some way. And we have this wonderful long-term study um, by Barbara Koenig's uh, mouse group, uh, where we have so many DNA samples over time of all the mice that have lived in this population, 
And we know one thing uh, that's very important, which is who founded the population. There are 12 mice that were the first mice in the population, and there's no evidence for any immigration into the population. And so all mice that have ever lived in the population are very closely related, and they're all descendants of, these, of some of these uh, 12 founders. Why is that important? Well, if you want to look at genetic variation in 10,000 mice or so, that, you know, what we need to do in this project, we need to find a cost-efficient way of doing that. We can't just sequence all the mice. That's way too expensive. So instead, what we're doing is we have sequenced a rather mid to high coverage, these 12 founders. Nine times coverage means that every base, basically, of, these, uh, of the genome of these mice has on average been sequenced nine times. And then we take all these 10,000 or so offspring. We haven't done them all yet, but that's what we are, we're working on at the moment. Um, and we're sequencing them at way lower coverage. So basically every base now has a chance of 3% to have been read, uh, sequenced once. So very little we actually know about the individual genomes of these mice. But then we're using modern statistical technologies um, known as imputation, where we infer statistically the genome of these uh, 10,000 mice by knowing that they, are, that they are related to these 12 founders. And so we can, um, uh, there's ways in which genetic variation is, is transmitted. And we know basically if one part of the genome is part of this, is descended from this founder in one of the mice, then the close parts of the genome in this mouse should also be descended from that. But I'm going to show you a little bit more about that now. We're using an algorithm that was built for a different purpose. It was built to detect um, at mixture between two or more ancestries in one focal individual, so that perhaps a specific part of a genome is um, passed on from this ancestry and the uh, and other parts of the genome are passed on from the other ancestry. It's very good at detecting such events. But instead of using two different ancestries, we're actually using the 12 founders of, of the population, or more specifically, the 24 haplotypes, which means that, of course, every founder is carrying two sets of chromosomes, and so we have 24 sets of chromosomes in that sense, 24 haplotypes. We're using this genetic variation um, as the ancestries in this algorithm, then with, in combination with the number of generations that have passed um, since the founding of the population, we can then infer which parts of the genome statistically are um, you know, have the ancestor, have one of the founders as its uh, ancestor. And if we do that um, for the mice, it, it looks something like this, just to shock you a little bit. Um, these are different chromosomes here, and these are individuals, and you see lots of colors. So basically all these different ancestries are contributing to the genomes of these um, offspring of later generations. If we zoom in a little bit, the important thing, we don't care so much about all this. You know, these are different probabilities for ancestries uh, have, being the ancestor of this individual here. Um, we care about the genotypes. What we can do for that is we look at, um, we summarize basically all the ancestries that uh, provide, that had an A as, its, uh, as a base here um, uh, at, this, at this location, and all the ancestries that had a G here. And if it looks like this, roughly half have A, half have G, and of course we know that this offspring should have an AG genotype. And uh, basically that's all, <laughs> that's all this to that in principle. Big question, of course, is does it work? And I only have a few seconds basically for that, so I'm giving you one example of it working. You can see here a PCA of um, the genetic variation in these imputed genotypes, but the color is based on microsatellites that we've used so far um, to, um, to identify the, um, uh, whether the mice carry the haplotype or not. And so you just can see very clearly that there is a good separation um, in genetic variation between those mice that carry the T um, based on the microsatellite data and those mice that don't. Um, and this is also seen in the imputed genotypes, this difference. But you can see these two weird black dots uh, that supposedly are wild types uh, that have you know, are part of the you know, um, uh, genetic variation that should represent the T haplotype mice. And we re-scored them and actually they are um, carrying the T-haplotype. So imputation is already correcting mistakes by the microsatellite, which is, which is very nice, even though it's not completely done yet. So the takeaway from this last section is that um, this sort of ultra-low coverage genome imputation can be a very efficient tool and much cheaper, actually, than um, uh, alternative tools to genotype thousands of individuals. We will now build the pedigree based on this data and look for loci that are associated with this person to get to the broader basis of this person in house mice. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention.
um, and for, for coming here today. Um, and I'm just going to briefly mention a few names um, that have been very helpful to me in the past four years. First of all, I want to thank all the, the funders, which are, of course, instrumental in making such a thing possible as a PhD. And I need to really thank uh, my supervisor, Anna, who has been such a great supervisor and has really given me a great opportunity, completely right, rescued me from being a content manager. Um, and uh, has really, uh, it, it has been tremendous fun and I wish I could do it all over again and I would do in a heartbeat. Also thank my collaborators, Andres, who's been very kind in New York and helpful still, and we will probably continue to work together in the future. Um, Hannah, who's been tremendous with her impact on the modeling chapter, um, the simulations. Uh, my committee, uh, more broadly, who will be talking a bit more uh, in a moment, and have, who have given great feedback in the past. Um, particularly, of course, Barbara, who has allowed me to work with this great study system, um, um, which I'll, without that, none of this would be possible. Um, so thank you for that very much. Uh, the people who've been working with the lab, uh, Bruce, of course, here, particularly in Zurich during my time, and Yari, who've been doing the um, who've been taking care of the mice and also genotyping the mice here. Corral in New York, uh, who's been uh, doing all the, <laughs> the hard work of actually sequencing the mice. Um, tons of students who've been ha very helpful, particularly in the um, experiment project, which is a very, very, uh, a lot of work. And so a lot of help was needed at different times and moments. Uh, I want to particularly thank uh, Aline, who's been very helpful in, um, in 2018 uh, with the experiments. Uh, the mouse group who've been so nice over the years if their name is not on there i'm very sorry the list is uh i tried to get everyone who i who i've encountered here um and finally some folks back home uh and friends uh in zurich more generally who've all been great and, and supportive um and of course my parents uh who've always uh, supported me throughout um thank you very much and i'm uh, very happy now to take your questions thank you Uh, just switched on the microphone briefly. Jan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <hello. laughs> Jan, thank you. That was a very clear and wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to um, invite questions from the audience. And because I, I can't see everybody so well i was ask you if you on the chat you would type your name in and then i can call you um jan could you please take out your screen because oh yeah okay. it's just difficult to see yep. the chat. one yeah. moment and i will now mute everybody besides jan and anna's and please mm -hmm. hand in your questions okay um yeah now we go Jan, do you, it, your microphone is on, isn't it? Yep. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, Andreas has a question. All right. Hi. Uh, Hi. Sorry, I'm just making sure I've got got it all here. Um, with with your your simulations, and I suppose also with the with the uh, with the work from the barn, um, I'm not. I'm not sure if, if I got my head around whether you would expect a difference between males and females for the T haplotype in terms of their propensity to migrate, because I could imagine that for females, even though they, they run the cost of having inviable offspring if they happen to, to mate with a T male, if the density is higher, they also get more chances for polyandry, so they might be better off in a, in a high density population. Could you elaborate a bit on that? Yes, I think it's extremely complicated, actually. Um, I have not simulated that. Um, so we found so far neither in the experiments nor in the barn any difference when it comes to the sex um, of the mice and uh, carrying the diaplotype and dispersal. Um, I think theoretically, I mean, I, I would love to get into that at some point, but I'm not sure if, if I will. But if I just had to summarize what I, what I think about it, um, I think you're right that from the individual perspective, there's probably a lot of conflict in the females. Uh, when it comes to whether they uh, should basically follow what is good for the T and what should, uh, is good for the rest of the genome. So that conflict, how it plays out, at the moment it seems uh, it just plays out to for, more in favor of the T. Um, but um, 
um, yeah, there is some some earlier work where they also predicted that it would be best for the T if both in the, if both sexes would mic would uh, disperse. Um, they still didn't know about the polyandry part, but um, uh, I think from the T's perspective, it's very much helpful if both. Um, would disperse. So just changing that, first of all, it might be easier to evolve a more general increase in dispersal than a sex-specific increase, but also um, just one generation after, I mean, of course, a T male in, uh, integrating a new, new population would gain the most benefits, perhaps, if the population is at a good density and there's no other T carriers, then it would be rapid increase in T frequency. But a female, just her sons basically will um, immediately will have that, right? So it's just what one generation removed, and there's some work showing that that would be enough to still select strongly for that. And perhaps in house mice, um, females might be better at uh, immigrating than males, um, which that's a bit harder to, to study. I'm not 100% sure that is actually the case, but that is something that has been suggested. And um, from that perspective, it might also be good to manipulate both sexes in that direction. But you're right, from the individual's perspective, this is perhaps much more, much more conflict even than in the males. Thank you. Um, Nina. Hi, Jan, and many thanks for a great seminar. I very much enjoyed it. It was very, very clear. I just want to ask a kind of a general question uh, and just pick your brains a bit about what you think about it. You started off in your general introduction uh, when you describe the T system that there is a paradox. So if you have a strong driver, you know, what is actually keeping it from either going extinct, you know, or in, in your case, maybe fixed. And you say that, you know, we now discover that there is a cost of viability in homozygotes as well as in sperm reduced sperm competition. However, you have now introduced this new concept of dispersal. So I just wanted to ask you how much the combined effect of reduced viability and reduced sperm competitive ability explain you know, the observed variation that you see in T in natural population. And if you add your, your contribution of differential dispersal to that, how much better that explains the pattern we see. So I've never worked on that uh, question directly, but... Um, if you speculate. Uh, yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> um, well, as far as I know, even um, the homozygous lethality and the sperm competition combined haven't been able to explain fully, especially in the system, in the population that we've been studying, um, the um, change in frequency over time. So this is really part of where this, really, where this came from, this question of dispersal, because it, uh, T was even disappearing quicker from the population than was explained by these two traits and perhaps leaving more likely would, would explain part of that too. But I think in the more global level, which is, you know, there's much less information on that, uh, but on a more global level, when it comes to the frequency of the T, of course, it would be a bit of a uh, different perspective because now we would expect the T to have higher possible frequencies in general, uh, globally, given this advantageous trade of dispersal. Um, whereas in one particular, in one population, we would expect perhaps lower frequencies of, of the T, given that it might be a very uh, ill-fitting ill uh, population for the fitness of the T. Um, so yes, um, I think that if we, if we look at it more on an evolutionary time scale, you know, the, the frequencies right now that they are so low, that is perhaps primarily explained by deleterious traits, but that, that they haven't been enough to actually um, sort of get rid of the T, make it go extinct. Um, uh, that could be explained in a good part, at least, by this dispersal trait. Um, and of course, the drive that keeps it um, staying uh, fit in many populations. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, next is um, Maxime Garcia has a question. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Jan. That was, I back up what was just said, really clear uh, presentation. That was really, really great. Um, I was actually aiming to ask a question about the, so the, when you did the experiment checking the um, density dependent dispersal of individuals that were the T haplotypes. So you mentioned that to measure um, this dispersal, you were actually looking at the individuals that were not found anymore afterwards. Uh, and I was wondering whether at the barn you have any idea about the predation rate um, that is occurring out there and whether you know whether there, if there is any predation, whether that's also density dependent and could contribute to explaining the results. Uh, yeah, so that's, um, 
you know, more generally mortality, but also predation. This is, of course, something that, that uh, comes to mind immediately. And it's also what we thought of as the good alternative explanation, perhaps, or the best, the next, next best alternative explanation. So predation in the barn, actually, there within the barn, there should be zero. Now, over the last few years, we have seen a little bit of that. Um, but generally speaking, predators cannot enter the barn. So within the barn, um, this shouldn't make a difference between between the mice, so there shouldn't be any predation in within the barn, especially in those years. Now, outside the barn, uh, there has been, at least um, in terms of uh, anecdotes, an increasing amount of cats that have that, that are living around the barn, um, where the tea or where mice in general, if they go out of the barn, might face predation. So. Uh, at the, at, in those times that I've been studying, this was still less of an issue, I've been told. Um, so there would be less of uh, that going on of predation outside of the barn. But of course, one thing that could happen is that mice that are exploring to leave the barn, they're leaving the barn just on a short trip and don't sort of intend to, uh, to disperse. Um, they might be um, preyed upon uh, outside the barn, never returning. And if they are at the right age in this, um, in this data set, they would show up as this process. So the actual alternative explanation for the data that we find would be that tea carrying mice are more likely to be preyed upon than wild type mice. I think that's not um, more likely, um, the more likely explanation than just an increase in dispersal because that it would still require some change genetically that they are more likely to be preyed upon and so not necessarily something that would be selected for. Um, but we also, when we look at um, just the mortality of juvenile mice that carry the tea or don't carry the tea, there's no difference within the barn, at least, um, when it comes to that. So that, again, weakens a little bit as alternative explanation, but I agree. That's also what we came up with as the next best explanation, just, I think, weaker, especially now, given all the data we have, but at the, even at the time, weaker than the, um, the one explanation that we, that we chose yeah, to focus on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Andres, you also have a question. Uh, sure. Well, Jan, congrats. That was really fantastic. Uh, yeah. I have a question relating to other parts of the genome that might be suppressing the, the effects of T and whether those could be, what, what can you tell us about them or if those, for example, could correlate with a higher weight or lower weight that might be related to pleiotropic effects of other parts of the genome that make T carrying more, more fit and so make them bigger and more likely to disperse or... Your explanations made sense, but I'm wondering about alternative uh, explanations. Yeah. So when it comes to suppression, there's nothing known in the tea, which is part of why it's been such an interesting thing to study for so many decades, because you know you would expect, as I, as I laid out in the beginning, you'd expect these suppressors, um, particularly on the homologous chromosome, but also elsewhere in the genome to evolve. Uh, but there's no evidence of that. Um, and so uh, pleiotropically, I think, um, well, more generally speaking, I think uh, the big uh, interesting question that still remains open is whether the T is actually manipulating the dispersal phenotype or perhaps the weight as well in, in these things or if um, the rest of the genome sort of also uh, is, um, is producing a different phenotype in the presence of the T. So is it actually that this is only benefiting the T in the genome um, or is, you know, given that there is a T in the genome now um, the rest of the genome would also benefit from increased dispersal rates or from increased weight or um, ex increased exploration. It's completely unknown at the moment. This is something that would be, will be great to, to look at um, with the uh, broader genetic uh, data set that we're now creating. Um, I think um, it's still, you know, particularly in the females, I think there's, uh, as I laid out earlier with dispersal, there's the biggest conflict. And so I wouldn't necessarily ex uh, expect um, the rest of the genome to contribute positively to this dispersal response. If I look, if I talk about my the simulations a little bit, we see rather evidence of in the simulations anyway of the rest of the genome um, sort of this decrease in an additive model of dispersal decreasing, uh, trying to dis decrease dispersal, um, but um, not successfully uh, doing so. So, um, yeah, I'm I'm not sure about about the particular. Uh, mechanisms at the moment and, 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 and the answers to these questions, but I think that that would be some of the next steps that need to be need to be looked at. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we have um, one more question from Janil. Hi, Jan. <laughs> cool, man. Thanks for such a great presentation. Um, 
just briefly, since density seems to be an important element in the probability of dispersion, uh, particularly affecting the pH haplotype, don't you think, or do you have any information if also the composition of the genotypes in the population uh, can affect this, and if animals can somehow, through the phenotype, detect which genotype each individual carries with them? Is there any information about that? Yeah, it's a very good question. It would, of course, uh, change a little bit how we look at this um, from a, a theoretical perspective, but also how we, how we try to answer this question. Well, thankfully, I should say, uh, we have some evidence in our population from previous work that it seems to be the case that um, T carriers cannot be distinguished from non-T carriers. Um, so uh, even though the uh, MHC is part of the T haplotype region, which generally is thought of making you know, the mice be um, differentiated by a smell, perhaps, um, but uh, this doesn't seem to be the case. At least there's no evidence for it in our population. Um, and so I've more or less conveniently uh, left out the idea of the modeling anyway of the simulations um, of um, them being able to detect uh, T carriers. I think this is also probably a more complicated uh, thing than to really know how the T frequency is in a population. Um, in terms of um, uh, looking at whether this changed anything in the barn, we also didn't have uh, that, I, if I remember correctly, there, there's no influence of that. Um, so ideally, of course, if you would imagine the, uh, you know, the best phenotype of the T would also, I think, include the presence of um, other T carriers in the population um, per, because of the homozygous lethality. Perhaps this can be somewhat solved um, with um, uh, inbreeding avoidance more generally, but we don't have any evidence that this is uh, particularly involved differently. But this would, this is part of why they should also disperse um, from lower density populations in some circumstances, if there is already uh, uh, the T um, at higher frequencies in those. Um, yes, as you point out, this is uh, fantastically uh, complex, but um, this does not seem to be a factor that uh, is, but is very relevant, at least from our, uh, from our work. Yeah. Thank you.